Hello everyone, uh, good morning, well, good afternoon, uh, Europe. Uh, my name is Sebastian and I am one of the founders of the European Campaign Playbook. Welcome to our second uh, uh, regular catch-up uh, this year. Um, I will be your host today, like in the, in the previous ones, and let me uh, first say hello to those who are following us on social media, there I can see uh, a few. There are two ways, you know this, if you followed us before, there are two ways to engage with us uh, today. The first one is to post your questions in the comment sections, uh, whether you're following us on YouTube or on Facebook, we will bring those questions to the, to the, to the table, to the guest. The second way though, more interesting, is that you can join us on camera and ask your questions directly to our members, to our guests, and just be part of the conversation. That's a, a different way of engaging in, in, in uh, webinars nowadays. I, we want to give you the, the, uh, the floor. You, we really want to exchange things with you live. Let me now say a, a few things for those who, uh, for the first time, have come across our community. Uh, the European Campaign Playbook. Uh, let me say that for years, uh, populists and nationalists, they've been following a very successful playbook, first to win campaigns and people hearts, which is how you win campaigns, but then to keep themselves in power for as long as they can. And in Europe, uh, we are no strangers to, to this phenomenon. We usually tend to look at the US, but we also have this phenomenon here in Europe. The playbook that these populists and authoritarians use is to divide, to polarize, separate people into warring camps. And the latest innovations in campaign technology have made it even easier for them to do that. That's why we as campaign advisors, we, we have an ethical responsibility when advising our candidates, our parties, uh, and uh, we must remember that. But equally important as pro-European campaigners, we need to create our own playbook, not to divide, but to uh, unite, to bring people together and to defend our European values. And this is what our community is about. The European Campaign Playbook is uh, a community created by a group of pro-European campaign professionals, a group of uh, former and current colleagues during the great lockdown of Zoom. Uh, we decided to organize, to exchange best, pra best practices and to help each other. Um, we want to forge new coalitions from left to right with one thing in common, our European values, uh, the respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, rule of law, and respect for human rights, something that is so basic that uh, we take it for uh, granted. And together... We will do that. We will write a playbook for you. I think, um, yeah, I think I went off camera just a second. Um, I just want to say that we are not for profit. Like we don't make any money out of this. We do not receive funding. The cost from running this small operation, such as the license for the website or the streaming platform are covered by ourselves. And uh, we are always looking for new people and to new ideas. So if you want to join us, go to our website, uh, campaignplaybook.eu, and drop us uh, a note. Uh, let us know that you, how you want to get involved. So um, we are, as I said in the beginning, in our Friday digital lunch. This is the time of the week that we as a community connect to uh, share best practices and meet with experts. Today's guest is Dr. Andre Heller, Professor for Marketing, Communication, Management, and Digital Marketing at the uh, Kaftein Tyrol University of Applied Science. And I'm gonna bring him, there you go. Hello, Andre. Hello, Hello everybody. Well, thank you, thank you for, for, for being uh, here uh, with us today. We have a fully packed agenda. Let me uh, share it on the screen. 
uh, to cover today uh, with you, but also with other members of the community who will uh, join us uh, uh, over the course of the next hour. I'm really interested to, to talk about uh, data-driven campaigns in Europe. We will definitely talk about the German general election and the uh, leadership contest this weekend in the CDU, uh, Merkel's uh, party. And then we always leave some room for random Q&A, you never know. Uh, but uh, we will make sure that any questions that is raised, we really cover it and talk about it today. Um, so uh, let me say, let's get started. No? So Andre, you, you published your dissertation about inter intentional self-scandalization by politicians. And you include as part of your research interest political and strategic communications, particularly campaign communication and digitization of political communication, which is very relevant to our chat today. But also uh, you include as part of your interest, crisis and scandal communication. So the first question that I have in mind uh, is, what is intentional self-scandalization by politicians? Are they uh, loving it? I, is the is the is there is are there strategies behind it? Please, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, Sebastian, and thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Um, to be honest, it was the first time I heard about your your network, and I think it's a pretty interesting, pretty interesting idea to bring together consultants, experts from the whole European Union. So, greetings from Bavaria, from Germany. This is my my living room, my, my office room. Um, I'm not in Kufstein in Austria um, right now because of the lockdown here in Germany and because of the, the harms uh, on my commuting way. So um, speaking about the dissertation and uh, the concept of self-scandalization, um, in the beginning I found out that many politicians, especially from right-wing uh, populist uh, parties, are um, often um, using provocations to gain public attention. Yeah, this is the main thesis of the, the dissertation. The book is also available uh, as a free ebook. Uh, you can Google that. Uh, the German title. It's unfortunately it's only in German. Um, and then I, I, I built up a theory explaining why politicians or parties would scandalize themselves, and uh, we see different examples for that. We saw different examples for that uh, thesis in the years after my, after the publication. So if you want, the dis dissertation could be seen as a playbook for Donald Trump, for example. Um, you see these examples every, every year, every month. Um, yeah, this is the main thesis and uh, I hope you will enjoy reading. <laughs> Yes, indeed. I I uh, I was also new to the to the concept of self scandalization, but I was uh, going through uh, your your research and your your background. I said, okay, this is it. Like this is this is explains so many uh, so many things, especially in the alt right, which you've also also uh, written about. So let's see if we can touch upon uh, a few of these uh, topics today. But the first thing that I, or the first question, the first question that I really wanted to to bring uh, to to the table is is more to do with uh, it's more practical because we the, the ones who are following this session or who will follow it over the next few few days is that uh, we are campaigners. We are campaigners. We advise political organizations. We are directly or indirectly involved in campaigns, and we see ourselves as more and more restricted in what we can do online, especially over the last few weeks. The last week, I think it has changed the whole landscape. You have written a paper on this. I will share the link for everyone who are who is following uh, uh, to, to take a look. Uh, uh, what can you tell us? What are the, the, the main lessons learned from, uh, from your research that you did in Europe, but more uh, precisely you did in uh, Germany? Yeah. That's right. Um, together with a colleague of mine, uh, Simon Kruszynski from University of Mainz, um, he's also a communications scholar like me. Um, we talked about uh, micro-targeting, I think it was in 2016 or something like that, at, uh, at an international conference in, in Prague. 
And then we thought about, okay, let's do this empirical <laughs> because there was less research on targeting or micro-targeting in the political context, especially in middle Europe, in central Europe. So we decided to, um, to interview politicians and uh, Simon had good connections to, to parties in one state in Bavaria, Rhineland Palatinate. And uh, in 2016, there were the um, national election, the, the state elections there. And we decided to ask every manager, uh, one manager uh, per party. Uh, for one party, in one party, we had two managers, uh, we asked. Uh, we kept, um, and we did a qualitative interview, qualitative interviews with them. And um, there were also several other issues uh, in the interview questionnaire, but um, tar targeting or data driven technologies particularly uh, referring to door-to-door uh, -to -door canvassing was the main topic. And we found out, and the most interesting thing of the study, I think, is uh, are not the empirical results, but um, the theoretical outcome, because um, we found out that there are restrictions on three, three levels for uh, data-driven campaigning in Germany and also in, uh, in the European context with slight differences. We have the first level, that's the ma macro level. Um, it contains the electoral and party system of a, a nation. The, this can be different in different uh, nations in the, in the U European Union. Second, the political culture, which might be different. And third, and that's the most important factor, we, 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 th we think, legal foundations, the legal framework of a, of a, a, a country or, or the European Union uh, overall. And on the MISO level, we had several other factors, for example, the party culture. MISO level refers to the organizational level. Second, the personal and financial resources. So how, met, how much money do parties have to, um, yeah, to execute uh, micro-targeting measures? And third, technology and infrastructure, um, speaking of resources. And then we have the micro level, and that's the most complicated one, I think, because uh, when it comes to people, <laughs> it's getting difficult. You can uh, plan uh, micro-targeting strategies. You might have a good data set, but when it comes to, to, to action, you have to speak with real people. So um, the first level would be the politicians and campaign managers. Second, volunteers or party members. Um, carrying out the campaign in most cases in most nations in European Union and third the voters and then we ask um, ask the campaigners the managers um, referring to these variables to these categories um, where where are problems or how do you do that and we found out that micro targeting in 2016 wasn't done very well in Germany and there were a lot of um, knowledge gaps, for example. We had two campaigners. Um, um, we, we asked them, um, do you also use uh, statistical methods like um, predictive modeling? And then they, they looked at us and, and asked back, what is predictive modeling? And this was in, in 2016. I mean, of course, uh, it could be that um, these colleagues um, were older or um, they, they uh, don't focus on these techniques because they're using more uh, traditional ones. This is also a finding uh, in some parties, uh, in some cases, for example, the, the social democrats in Rhineland Palatinate, they have a, a traditional party culture. Yeah, it's more, a lot about uh, local, um, local um, yeah, outlets of the SPD. Uh, it has a lot, lot, lot to do with uh, union workers um, in the last th 30 years living there and so on. So it's really, really difficult. It's really, really difficult. And one might say that um, micro-targeting in Germany is only possible on social network sites and other online, uh, online platforms because of mainly the legal foundation, which is now the European legal foundation for every nation. And and do you think that uh, that has changed uh, much? I mean, we will we will see a, an election in in a few months in the same country in Germany. And I have the your paper in front of me, uh, table three, where you uh, you analyze uh, different variables for the main parties, SPD, CDU. 
And and I could see, I mean, that was back in 2016, but let me tell you as an insider, I, uh, my feeling is that it hasn't moved uh, that much uh, since then. And I can see that, for example, uh, there are certain parties, go and take a look uh, at the, uh, at the uh, paper, but they, their technological infrastructure were non-existent or it was relying mostly offline and on paper and maps. Uh, and that's that's 2016. That's uh, almost 10 years after uh, the Obama campaign. It was at the same time that the Hillary uh, campaign. So uh, what's your feeling? Do you think from what you and your colleague have been seeing over the last few years, where are we? And what is the, the future? I mean, is there any future to... Uh, political micro-targeting in Europe? I'm sure that there, there is a future for micro-targeting in, in Europe. Um, and it I think it has to do with the personnel, the, the, the individuals working at parties or organizations or at marketing agencies. I think a lot of people uh, working in parties and also volunteering in parties, for example, uh, in canvassing, are older. And, of course, they are not near... The, the technological op opportunities or possibilities there. Of course, they can use a computer or a tablet, but um, as far as I know, and I talk to a lot of politicians and also to volunteers, for example, I had a, um, yeah, I made a training in uh, January 20, yeah, a year, year, year ago, before the lockdown <laughs> came um, for local um, campaigners of all parties in my hometown. Um, it was for a foundation. Foundation was inviting them, and I was the, yeah, the the the, the person talking about uh, digital campaigning, and I showed them the possibility to use Google My Maps to um, to um, yeah to mark the the regions where the campaigners, the volunteers, uh, should ring the bell. And they were like, "Oh, this sounds logical," and then I was, "Okay, why don't you do that?" And they said, OK, we will try. They didn't. Um, it has to do with, in, with individuals. It is hard in Germany, especially in Germany, um, to mobilize volunteers in parties to go outside and ring at other doorbells, because it's a kind of a cultural thing that was also mentioned in interviews we did. Um, Germans hate it when the, the door, <laughs> doorbell rings and we don't know who is outside, not because we are afraid, but it's for many people, it's kind of offending to ring at foreigners' doorbells. I know it's normal or more normal in, in Southern European states and nations, and it's kind of uh, really positive. I like it, um, but it's difficult. And the second problem is if uh, they uh, if you ring the doorbell and they open up and they see, oh, this guy is from the CSU or from the Greens, uh, I don't want to talk about politics. Leave me alone. Yeah, that's the second thing. But I think there is a future because uh, people in our age, um, also younger persons studying at my uh, university, for example, they use these digital tools. For example, Google My Maps is a really real simple tool, but powerful tool um, uh, in a normal way. So they go inside the shops, they, they enter the shops, they um, work at agencies, at um, parties, at unions and so on. And they will use it as a normal tool, for example, as uh, paper and pencil in the 1950s. I mean, let me say, let's focus on on canvassing uh, because to me, it's it's uh, it's one of the the, the joys uh, uh, that I always have as a campaigner, but it's also one of the uh, uh, frustrations. I I started my. Like, uh, I mean, uh, I started campaigning as such in the UK for for the Liberal Democrats uh, back then, and, and there the culture is it's. I mean, you you just don't, don't even ask. You the first day you sign up, they send you to knock on doors, and I was knocking on uh, knocking on doors in uh, Tower Hamlets, which is one of the poorest neighborhoods in in the UK, definitely in London. They it's a Few steps, uh, uh, few steps uh, away from the from Canary Wharf, uh, where I used to work, and I and I used to go to Tower Hamlets to do that to do canvassing. It was quite normal. In fact, uh, we, the Liberal Democrats, were the only ones who could enter to certain places. If you were a Tory, uh, there are some places that you would find yourself in in 
in, in a in a very funny situation mm -hmm. and and i was knocking on doors and people were opening uh the door and i could see you know their kids on the background playing and i was having a conversation and then i would move on to the next thing when i explained this to one of the most uh, famous uh, TV anchors in Spain, she said, if you do that here in Spain, you, I would think uh, that you are, I don't know, you're a Mormon, you are, you know, you, I mean, what are you doing at my doorstep? It's pretty invasive uh, and, and, and I think it is changing, um, but definitely in Spain, it would be unthinkable and, and yet, I see it as one of the main alternatives uh, for uh, campaigning, and one of the and according to the research, you might be also well aware of the research performed mostly in the U.S. It's it's what changes people's minds is not direct mail, is not online advertising, is having conversations. So, mm -hmm. so according to your experience and your research, um, what is the um, uh, uh, what is the best way for our campaigns to adopt these uh, strategies? Supported, of course, with technology and also respecting the current legal framework, which is GDPR, even Germany has its own version, a little bit more restricted than GDPR, yet they do that. They do uh, campaign, uh, they do door-to-door uh, -door canvassing, and, and it is fine. What are the the you know your your main advice for for us to implement it in our campaigns? Mm -hmm. First of all, I would like to second that uh, that opinion that canvassing door to door canvassing um, can change minds or uh, or or particularly um, mobilize people get out the vote to get out the vote. Um, you know, change, changing opinions is kind of difficult. <laughs> But you're right, um, and there is research in the U.S. showing that the mobilization um, is rising when there is more door-to-door -door cam canvassing because um, it's um, and that's uh, the most positive thing about uh, the whole uh, digital channels or digital tools. I think it's a transformation, uh, an, um, an improvement of the oldest political communication instrument, namely to talk to people, yeah, to, to talk to real people. And that's a kind of interesting and uh, I think uh, positive uh, thing. So how to do that? Um, in Germany, the German parties in the more, more professional elections, they um, experimented with some tools. For example, the, the CDU, um, also the CSU and uh, also the Greens used applications, mobile applications for mobile phones um, for their canvases um the, the the volunteers go out knock on the door um go to the next door and so on and in, in the end they could for example um give an information to the campaign manager uh, how the yeah how the attitude was in that street but not in this in, in a particular household because of the gdpr of course uh, there were also were also some ideas um, of gamification of uh, political campaigns. For example, the CSU they had um, yeah some kind of a competition for all members. They could also download an app and uh, share posts. And for each shared post, you get points. And for every doorbell, you you get points and so on. And what they said, what the what one guy said to me is that it worked quite well. Um, I think uh, it's, it was a kind of clever idea because the, you adapt this, um, yeah, digital um, mind of people, yeah, um, like playing around, uh, doing experiments, and so on. So um, this could be an idea, and it could be an idea with, which is absolutely okay with the legal framework because you don't collect people's personal data, you don't store them, you don't uh, use them in a statistical. Uh, clustering or something like that. Um, I think one should think about um, um, campaign managers uh, should should think, think about which tools are useful for which important tasks to do and not uh, experimenting too much. But um, like I said, Google My Maps or Open Open Maps can be used um, to um, yeah to organize a canvassing campaign, and you can. A program and an app to mobilize your volunteers, for example, with direct mails from the um, yeah the running candidate, 
um, or uh, motivating quotes and so on. I think this can be used, but um, it's in Europe, in most in most European countries, and I think also in uh, Germany, in particular in Germany, the diffusion from the US is kind of longer. <laughs> I, at this point, I'm gonna I'm gonna take one of the questions that we have on social media is from Eduardo uh, Beber, and it's it's pretty much on point. So he he said, "What would be the closest thing to ringing bells uh, and get people involved in the in the post COVID uh, area? Uh, what have you seen? Uh, uh, have you been following how campaigns and parties have adapted to the to campaigning under COVID?" um so the the question is aiming at uh, the the lockdown phase right now or or afterwards it was, it was afterwards am i correct I think, yeah and uh, he he specifically ah, said yeah. post covid uh, mm -hmm. and then i added a uh, okay and yeah. i added the, the question then but yeah, yeah it's post covid okay um so the the let me speak about the main problem right now because interesting is uh, we have in germany um, i have to look it up um, in germany we have um, some elections that year it's some kind of a super election here we have one two three four five six seven eight nine ten state elections in 21 and I'm sure, and I know exactly from one, one party that they became aware of, uh, last week that that could cause a problem, COVID-19, <laughs> because they wanted to, to mobilize the people to go out and uh, yeah, knock on the doors. <laughs> and I think, um, yeah, it's, you can't do it. It's uh, forbidden. Uh, I think the digital tools will be most import the most important tools in these elections aside from mass media advertising, of course. But I think there will be more and more money will be put into um, sponsored posts, sponsored ads, for example, in that year. So this would be the alternative, if but, that but, answers the question, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I, th I think it, it, it completely uh, addresses that. And, and but then, then the thing is, we are seeing um, especially, I mean, it's it has happened in the U.S., but uh, it, there will be some knock-on effects. So we 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 have seen major platforms uh, banning political ads during, uh, on, and after uh, an election uh, takes place. So, um, do you think? Um, I know you are not a scholar. You uh, uh, you are not a legal uh, scholar. You don't know what's going to happen uh, regulation-wise, but it is easy to to forecast more and more restrictions and more oversight and probably people being more campaigns being more conservative um so probably probably the the, the alternative or what we're gonna see uh and let's start uh, getting into the next topic which is the the german elections is we're gonna see more and more money uh, going to traditional media no uh, that can well be the case no the tv radio uh, yeah, yes and no. Um, besides the paid media channels, um, more um, many pe people, many politicians, and also advisors for, uh, forget that there is also own owned media in social media. So, if um, I, I strongly recommend politicians to build up communities to speak to the people with regular posts um, to um, get a dialogue, uh, get into dialogue with them. Because um, what we are seeing is that um, the most successful, many success, successful politicians on Facebook, for example, are uh, successful because they build up communities. They talk to people. They show not. They don't do not all um, do not ex exclusively post um, information, but also personal stuff like oh, now is like I'm on, on vacation. Have fun, uh, have also fun with the vacation or something like that. So this is um, something. Um, coming to speaking about content marketing, yeah. Um, what a lot, uh, lot of uh, agencies, marketing agencies, also advisors don't know or don't know how to do. 
So this is uh, an interesting thing. The second question was aiming about the yeah the outcomes, more money into mass media. I don't know. I'm not sure if the restrictions will be in the next years will be so harsh that micro targeting isn't possible anymore. Because I think it's uh, it would be quite useful um, if politicians can use targeting options, but not into too much details. I think uh, these channels will be more uh, interesting for politicians, for parties, because you uh, spend less money, you're more accurate than, uh, for example, with a print paper uh, um, advertising. And then you also have rules in different state in nations. For example, in Germany, you, Germany, you can't buy yourself into television. This is regulated. You have um, every party has fixed times and uh, every party has the same time slots so you don't have an advantage if you are the cdu or social democrats compared to a small party with 200 members so um there are also restrictions so it's kind of complicated i won't i don't see mass media channels um yeah um on a new rise they of course they are very important this is um, te television is the leading um media type um, and will be in the next 10 and 50 year, 15 years, I'm pretty sure. But um, looking at the budgets uh, in campaigning, uh, politicians will also and increasingly focus on digital platforms like Google AdWords, like sponsored ads, and so on. And what about these emerging platforms uh, that are, they are calling themselves like uh, uh, freedom of speech, uh, 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 heavens, uh, or you can just say whatever you want. There is no moderation. I mean, there is moderation, but of course, it's uh, it's uh, it's just the the. Uh, I'm talking about parallel, for example. Eh? I'm not uh, shying away from from naming it. They say there is moderation, but um, uh, we can even talk about moderation if you want. Uh, I would be very interested in, in knowing uh, uh, about uh, your views on that, but. Um, if uh, you said uh, Facebook, it will be a, a an important one, definitely. On Twitter, you cannot do political ads. Uh, then it, it is down to to in terms of the big ones, YouTube, uh, Google, the, the the Google Alphabet uh, world. But then you have smaller ones like Parler. Okay, I think it's it's uh, let, let's talk about that. But also other which are not which are uh, such as Twitch. Which are um, are engaging with a young um, audience, millennials, but and also who are not interested in politics, but in online gaming. No? Mm -hmm. So um, that is that will definitely be part of the of the picture uh, this year, especially in Germany. Um, you have a one MEP uh, who is uh, really active on Twitch. And, and so what's your, your view on that, on this emerging, I call it emerging platforms, but they, they can be, um, uh, you know, they can be the, this uh, parallel type of thing or other emerging platforms where uh, politicians haven't really been active until now. Mm. Yeah, this is um, an interesting question. And the in interesting part is that, like uh, this question is um, often asked to be, um, for example, in, in seminars and so on, or uh, public uh, lectures. Um, the thing is, we don't know where people will go to to inform, to entertain themselves. What is clear is that Facebook and Instagram will remain the, the two most influential channels in social network sites in Germany, for example. You, you mentioned Twitter. Twitter isn't that important in Germany. I think it's important for experts, for journalists, but not for the normal voter. Um, most people don't have a Twitter account. Eh? Um, and also the, the banning of, of ads on Twitter, a colleague of mine said um, to, um, one and a half years uh, ago or something like that, uh, she said, um, yeah, of course they are banning it because they, they didn't make money out of it before because most money get, goes into Facebook advertising or YouTube and so on. I think it's, it could, that could be the case, yeah, to, you know, greenwash yourself in an IT, uh, in the IT sector. <laughs> um, the thing is, the, the smaller channels uh, emerging right now, it's interesting. I think it 
could be um, advantages for uh, uh, could, could give advantages for uh, yeah for smaller parties maybe we and also for extreme or populist parties we will see the, um, that the followers the the community if you will the community of um, of Donald J Trump will follow him to a new channel I'm pretty sure that most of them will follow him on another platform uh, we don't know yet yeah um, but for I'd say traditional parties um, social democratic parties uh, Christian parties and so on I wouldn't recommend to use every new channel because then you don't do it right on each channel. Um, just focus on Facebook, just focus on Instagram, maybe do some experiments with YouTube, yeah, but do less videos, but good videos. Um, use some other tools, be creative, like um, using Google My Maps. Again, Google My Maps is a really cool tool. I, I recommend it to, to hyper local candidates here in the, the city council election i recommended it to them and i said let's paint some information and in. let's paint information uh, let's give some information on historic houses here in the city on closed down bars or, or pubs these are interesting information for local voters yeah it's not about uh, putting up uh, 30 pages of your party program or something like this so um what i would like to say is content first and then channel that's that's the most important thing indeed uh, and i couldn't i couldn't agree i couldn't agree more i i, I think that uh, uh and um if you choose if you choose the the wrong channel, then then you can end up having the opposite effect. No, you see, uh, and there was an example. There was an example uh, in a, in a southern country of a politician who, very close to the election, he made a move. Uh, I, I can't say the specifics, but if you follow it, uh, you will know, and 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 then it backfired completely. So definitely. First is the your strategy, who you are, your message, your content, and then the uh, the uh, the platform. On um, the the day the day that, for example, we started to see, uh, I was following Parler as a more passive user to see what was going on because Spain's far right is it was quite active. It's been quite active mm -hmm. and. And then we saw what happened last week, and then the ban from the social media platforms, but also the uh, Android and uh, Apple uh, withdrawing uh, Parler from their uh, from their store. Were you relieved to to see that, or or a little bit more concerned, more on a mm -hmm. on a personal level? No, where you say, okay, I think that was maybe too late, but it was the the right move, or are you of the view that? Okay, hang on. Uh, perhaps you're having too much power to uh, to do these things. This is um, a difficult question, um, but my main position is um, you can't fix problems by deleting them from the screen. We see it in uh, in the case of Donald Trump and Twitter. He will come back online with another platform, maybe an own platform. Uh, there were rumors that he will build up an own platform to communicate. Um, of course, not everybody will follow him there, but I'm sure that TV stations and other media will report about um, provocations, self scandalizations again, like in the last years, because the news worth is too, too high, the news value is too high of him. Um, Donald Trump guarantees high ratings for sure, and this this is sure for next years. So um, I wouldn't, if I would be um, yeah manager at big tech at a big tech company, I think I would really um, think about it and really uh, try to to use other measures. For example, um, banning single tweets with the information that the informations in the tweet are false or, or wrong. This is a good idea, I think, because people uh, going on the platform looking uh, want want to uh, want to look at Donald Trump and they see um, this tweet was was banned because of possible disinformation. So I think there's a learning effect for everybody, for the people uh, visiting the platforms, 
and also maybe for some politicians, not for Donald Trump, but, but for other, other uh, politicians, uh, maybe um, low level politicians, and they, they see, oh, I can't do that. I get banned. Uh, this um, my actions have have um, have um, actions afterwards. So I think um, banning for uh, for a lifetime is not a good idea because um, you can't uh, hide problems in real life on the internet. They will breach through. They will find another channel, another platform. The, the, it's it, it's interesting that you mentioned that because the, um, and I think I, I would need to find it, but they, they, there was some research uh, done or just some uh, data put together saying that actually the the, the tweets flagged as um, you know dubious or containing false information from Trump th that didn't stop the, the 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 tweet to go to mm. reach. Uh, mm. more people maybe it was the context i'm pretty sure it was more mm. uh, i mean these tweets uh, and the uh, the uh, uh, and the context and the, uh, yeah. on which they were treated i think it was it was uh uh i mean i i, I was going to 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 check trump every couple of minutes to see if he's <laughs> done anything crazy mm. so but it is true that even with these uh we with, with these warnings Data tells us that they, they, that doesn't stop tweets from mm. uh, from being shared. What about um, uh, because I'm really uh, I'm really interested on this, and I'm pretty sure the the, the people following us uh, will appreciate too. What about uh, instant messaging platforms uh, in uh, in Germany? Uh, did you see them back then in 2016? Uh, I, I probably WhatsApp wasn't a, a big player, but do you see it now? Uh, and, and what are like if you need to draw a map of the what are the main platforms uh, politicians and parties use in Germany? Which ones would be the the most important? Which are uh, which ones are the emerging ones that we will see this year? Mm. Most important important one, um, of course, WhatsApp in Germany. Um, also, Facebook Messenger and Instant Messenger are um, pretty important features. Um, but as far as I know, it isn't used very um, elaborated in the campaigning context in Germany. Politicians, party members use it for collaborative work, for organization of campaigns, of course. And um, But we have another channel you, uh, causing problems not only in Germany, but also other countries, Telegram. Um, and I think the, the main problems problem in, in future campaigns uh, is, is main problem is not that politicians use these channels and maybe uh, misbehave. I think the main problem are external uh, actors in the political field. For example, uh, conspiracy conspiracy uh, um, 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 groups or maybe also terrorist group, right or left wing. Um, we see that on on Telegram, and it will be, it will be really really difficult to to uh, get an overview, to um, control it. Um, it's, um, you know, a problem to to keep balance between, um, yeah, um, going in by with law uh, and, and breaching in or, uh, or, or uh, going into the groups and uh, espionage or something like this. And on the other side, freedom of speech. That's, that's a real problem. And we saw it in 2015 when the refugee crisis uh, reached its climax. Um, that on on WhatsApp groups, especially WhatsApp groups, um, there were many many disinformation messages in uh, local groups uh, of football clubs or I don't know, um, done by far right um, extremists. And I, I think this will continue, and this will be um, yeah get um, will be um, will become more and more of a problem because you can't control it uh, it's not donald trump or not uh, this politician tweeting or posting or using a messenger we don't know where the this information comes from that bill gates wants to uh, control all of us yeah so that's the problem and um yeah we don't know uh, how many people will see the message or how many people would believe the message uh, we can't talk to these people because we don't know, uh, in the most cases, we don't know who was the receiver. So it's kind of an asymmetrical way, if you if you like. There was this this term of asymmetrical um, warfare when the Islamist terrorism 
was on the rise in the 2000 years. And I think it, it's kind of not the same, but it's comparable. You don't know who is the enemy, who is the guy, the group um, threatening democracy. So, so, so you think we uh, we we won't have uh, uh, another boring election in Germany where all the uh, mm. boring for the standards of uh, of uh, Germany? No, I think I think uh, um, and we can talk a, a little bit more about the the uh, um, the election contest uh, this weekend. I mean, you you can have for for the standards of Germany. Some of the candidates for the CDU can be quite, uh, I don't know, radical, revolt. I mean, uh, we even have uh, a millionaire, uh, uh, self-made, is it self-made billionaire um, uh, who is polling very high, probably one of the highest uh, uh, at the moment. Um, I know he's no Trump, uh, but uh, do you think it will be, Communications wise, uh, will it be a really interesting election to, to? Yeah, absolutely. I I am uh, really thr thrilled about next Saturday because there will be a decision, not the end decision, because uh, all members of the or all people allowed to vote have to cast their vote again by mail, by normal letter. But I think the results, if there are more than five percent difference between the first and the second i think the results are pretty clear yeah um we have three candidates um you were speaking about friedrich merz friedrich merz was also um he was politician before he was one of the leading politicians of the cdu um and some kind of an opponent of angela merkel in her first years of her career uh, in the bundestag um he yeah got kicked out more or less uh, out of the the cdu um because it was a yeah fight for power in the cdu and then he made that um, high amount of money by working for consulting groups uh, financial sector and so on and yeah now he's back the second uh, candidate is norbert rotken he w once was a minister um and got also kind of kicked out by Angela Merkel <laughs> or by the others um, because he uh, he failed at a state election. Um, I think uh, this is the candidate with uh, the, yeah, with uh, less chances. And then third, we have um, Armin Laschet, the prime minister of North Rhine-Westphalia. Um, and the main differences between these three candidates, uh, Armin Laschet is a more, uh, more liberal candidate. Um, Norbert Röttgen, I'd say, kind of old school CDU, but he tries to be very modern. Um, and then if you have Friedrich Merz, that's CDU of the 1990s, beginning 2000 years, which isn't uh, meant by, uh, in, a, in a way of um, saying it's positive or negative, because he has very, very um, much a high number of followers. The thing, thing is, um, the, if you look at the polls, uh, Friedrich Merz is on first place, but the thing is the polls are not that accurate because um, they are either um, either asking all of the Germans, yeah, a sample of all the Germans, or all CDU members. But the thing is, most of both groups are not allowed to vote on Saturday. These are delegates, like you, yeah, kind of a, you know. Um, in, in the US when it comes to uh, elected president. We don't know how, how the, the delegates will uh, vote on Saturday. It will be very, very um, exciting. I'm I'm not sure uh, if anybody uh, has a clear um, yeah, view on that. Um, um, the last days, um, yesterday Armin Laschet and two days before um, Friedrich Merz were guests at a famous TV show in Germany uh, of Markus Lanz on the second television channel. And I had the impression that no nobody of them, um, either Laschet nor, uh, nor Metz, um, have an idea how they they are standing there, how, how, how much chances they have. I think they are kind of not afraid, but insecure. Insecure. So th th this will be really, really uh, exciting. And then we have another problem speaking about the, the chancellor um, in the future because we have election, Bundestag election, chancellor election in the end of in, in, in end of this year. 
uh, because in the union we have also the CSU, the Bavarian uh, version of the CDU, which is a, an extra party. Most people don't notice that, don't know that. It's not uh, that the CSU is a part of the CDU. Uh, the CSU is, a, is an extra party here in Bavaria. And the prime minister here in Bavaria, Markus Söder, which is also the chairman of the CSU, um, is that guy um, with the highest ratings when it comes to the question, uh, which politicians do you want to see as your next chancellor? So what will happen? I don't know. Um, Markus Söder, the prime minister, said uh, his place is in Bavaria. He won't, uh, doesn't want to, to leave. But it could be, of course, also a strategic measure because then in the end they could ask him and beg him and maybe he could explain it and said, yeah, um, Germany needs me or I don't know. Um, good so thing, good thing the, 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 the if elected uh, in the in a CDU candidate and in the election, would he be the first Bavarian to, to, to become chancellor? Not the first Bavarian because the first Bavarian uh, who became chancellor is... Um, uh, Ludwig Erhard, yeah, he's um, from Bavaria originally, but he was member of the CDU. Um, um, it, he would be the first CSU chancellor. There were two attempts in in the end of the 80s. Franz Josef Strauss was running for uh, for chancellor. He lost, and then in 2002, uh, Edmund Stoiber from the CSU, he also lost. Uh, and this would be, if he will run for, for chancellor, the first CSU uh, chancellor in Germany. But we will see. I'm, if I had to guess, I'd say Friedrich Merz will win on Saturday. I think um, delegates are not, uh, in, a, in every case, the um, elites of the party. You know, um, these are normal people, normal women and men. Um, working at their local party uh, um, outlet or um, doing doing stuff there, uh, maybe sitting in city councils, and they have their own opinion there in the in the uh, local um, outlets. And yeah, the influence of the the party leadership is quite low on Saturday. That's my my impression. Okay. Well, let, let's then do, do, do the following. Uh, we, we connect again uh, before the September election and, and we will try to do an election night in Berlin if everything is, uh, I mean, if, you know, COVID permitting. And, and, but what we're doing as part of the, the European campaign playbook is that we, uh, in the same way that we covered the U.S. election night, uh, we, uh, some of us, stay until uh, until the the morning after. We what we're doing is we're doing a round uh, this year, and and we will try to follow the results uh, live from the most important elections. And and then what we do is we we connect before the election. You tell us how. What are the things that are that you you see more innovative? What things have been the most uh, interesting to to witness? And if possible, uh, and if you are around in Berlin, it would be great to uh, to to grab a beer and celebrate that the election has gone well. There hasn't been any major uh, disruptions, and that uh, we see. We see Merkel, you know, going outside, uh, uh, going through that door. Something that it's unbelievable here in Brussels too. So I'm talking uh, to you from Brussels. Uh, it's uh, it's unbelievable. I mean, no one knows what's gonna be, what's gonna look like. It, 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 even uh, uh, um, it's one of the biggest political factors, no? Uh, risk factors this year. No? How is gonna? Uh, how is Europe and the world gonna look like without Merkel, which speaks uh, a lot about about her leadership? And and we do that. Okay, we um, we we make sure that we connect uh, mm -hmm. before the election. This conversation was very very interesting. Uh, I, I learned a lot. And and the last thing that I that I always ask the the people who join us. Yes, it's uh, to recommend a book, a movie, something interesting to share with the with the group. In your case, you can do that, or maybe you can tell us what you are focusing on uh, 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 in terms of research uh, this year. Uh, what or 
uh, what interesting things are going to be uh, looking for. And, and with that, we can wrap it up. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, we, we were talking a lot about door-to-door -door canvassing. And there is a book of a colleague of mine from Oxford, a uh, really interesting book. Uh, it's, uh, it's a scientific book, but it's, uh, it's entertaining. It's really good written. It's uh, called Crowned Wars from Rasmus Gleis Nielsen. It's um, out of 2012, I think, um, and he did some uh, research in the US context. He was part of a campaign, an election campaign. He was able to uh, observe the people there. And it's um, kind of an interesting look back into 2012, how the Obama campaigns and other campaigns really worked um, in practice. And uh, he was also uh, writing about uh, the digital tools uh, used there and so on so the book crowned wars is really really uh, it was groundbreaking for the research on door-to-door -door and digital um, campaign um, canvassing what i'm going to do that year yes a huh, lot of teaching online <laughs> um, i hope that we can that we can use our new uh, research infrastructure because um, before the lockdown we uh, bought eye tracking and human behavior technology for the university which is now locked in a room nobody's there um, it's stored stored there so i hope that uh, my students and i um, and other colleagues can can work on that and and can uh, can yeah uh, see how, how much and what is possible with that research soft and hardware perfect so Good luck. Thank you again for, for your time. Uh, I you. hope you had fun. Uh, I certainly did. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation and uh, stay healthy <laughs> in the next time, all of you. And um, yeah, I hope to see you again, maybe before the election. Of course, cool. that would be, would be cool. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a given. I'll, I'll definitely uh, reach out. Okay. Thank you, Andre. And thank you, everyone thank you. Who, who follow us. There are a few more questions, but we we really need to get back to our busy uh, daily lives. Uh, but I promise we will bring Andre back. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.